Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the AES lecture. I'm Ben Sutter, the chairman, and I'll be introducing Gavin in a moment. Two points about it. If uh, Mac OS X catches fire, the fire exit behind you where you came in. Uh, the second point about it is there's quite a lot of new people here. I'll be passing this down. This is just a sign up sheet, whether you're an AES member or not, put your name down, and um, it's good to know you're here. Thank you. Um, Gavin is, as you probably know because you're here, from Future Audio Workshop, which is a synthesizer company based in Donegal and also based in Berlin. And he'll be showing us bits of the underneath of the um, very successful Circle Software Synth. Now, I work for Novation Alignment Hardware Synth, so I'm very, very interested in what you have to say. No pressure at all. <laughs> yeah. If you're not here to hear me, you're here to hear Gavin, so I'll um, pass over. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so I'm here to really talk about what exactly is going on behind the interface in Circle. So maybe it's first best if I um, give a demonstration of what Circle does and what its capabilities are, and then we can lead into the technical aspects of, of the design of, of, of it in software. So Circle is a modular synthesizer. It has uh, four oscillators down here on the side. They're um, changeable between analog and wavetable. Um, you know, your classical wavetable uh, oscillators. You then have a mixer section here. You have insert effects, uh, parametric EQs, all the uh, usual types of distortions, uh, bit crushers. Uh, then you have like an analog modeled filter in the center here. And then you have another insert effect and your VCA. Um, along the right hand side here, then you have modulation sources which can be connected up to any control on the interface. So the way we were kind of thinking about when we were designing the synthesizer was to kind of think about modulations like an extra pair of hands. So, you know, you can just kind of take a modulation source and put it onto the filter there. And if I open up the keyboard, so you can see how the, and you can maybe slow down the rate there. So we want to kind of make, make everything more visual as well, you, so you can kind of like see the modulation. You know, if you're classical hardware synth, everything's very abstract. You're just looking at a control panel and you don't actually see where the modulation signals are or you don't you know, see where the connections are. So we want to kind of bring out all that information and use software for that. Um, yeah, then we have our settings pane. Then we have um, uh, effects section on the output. Um, three, three effects here. So you have like echoes and um, various phasers. It hurts everybody's ears. <laughs> yeah, not the first time. All right. So yeah, that's kind of the basic um, system that Circle is. Uh, behind that then is uh, a whole modular um, audio library written in C++. So what I'm going to talk about next is what exactly happens when, let's say, I take one of these modulation sources and drop it here and then adjust the amount of that modulation. What is happening in terms of the flow of audio, you know, what, how, how that's arranged, how the whole thing is put together. So I'm going to start with a PowerPoint presentation. They're always very exciting, so you can... <laughs> well, it's more to keep me on track so I don't get too lost. Uh, yeah, it's a modular synthesizer, VST audio unit, RTAS. Uh, it's out on Windows and OS X. Um, my background myself is I studied DSP in Queen Mary. Um, I then went to work in a company called Archery in France. Uh, they're a plug-in company. They also do hardware synthesizers. Um, set up the company in 2007. Circle itself, it took one year development with four people working on it. So there was two developers, myself and a guy called Pierre. And there was another two graphic designers. Um, so in total, it was one year development time. Where to start? Like, how do you go about building a, building a plugin? There's so much stuff there that has to be dealt with. Like, how do you make sure that when you build this plugin that it's going to work in RTAS, it's going to work in VST, it's going to work on the Mac, it's going to work on Windows? We decided that we would use an open source uh, framework called Juice to allow us to do that. So basically what that means is that we can write one single code base and then target the different platforms without having to you know, worry about what, uh, what different platform we're on. It's, it's all totally wraps up and encapsulates what we do. So it kind of abstracts out the, the hardware and, and, and the operating system from us. So if we want to open a file or uh, load something into the software, we just use the one kind of function call in C++. We don't have to deal with, with different ones for different operating systems. 
um, yeah, and it just it, it basically it just allows us to you know um, build something like Circle. Beforehand, let's say around 2000, uh, there wasn't a framework like Juice, so uh, you would need a massive development team, maybe you know 10 to 15 people to get uh, a really good plugin done. You'd have to develop that kind of framework yourself and everything. So. There's really uh, a lot of credit has to be given to Jules, who wrote this Jules framework uh, to allow us to do what we did. Um, yeah, so where to start? We kind of had this idea of that we wanted to build a synthesizer. Uh, it's almost like the back of a napkin stuff. You just sit down, drew out an interface, and kind of figured out what kind of modules we wanted to put into, this, into, the, uh, into the audio library. Uh, just did a basic functional specification document, uh, workflows, you know, special components. If you remember looking at the interface there, you saw the way the modulation was changing. We had to think about how all that would work and how that would kind of like work with the audio library and how we'd be able to display that information and, and interact with the, with the DSP side of it. Yeah, so it's just draw the whole modular system on a sheet of paper. That's basically what we did. Uh, we started with something very small. So we would look at, let's say, an oscillator, um, a filter, and a VCA. And we would then write the code around that that would mean that we could maybe connect those three modules up together. And as we were kind of writing this, um, we, we decided that, oh, I better get back on, yeah. So we split this work into two first, uh, the interface and the audio engine. So uh, we used the model view controller pattern, which means that um, the interface has no real intelligence or logic inside it. Uh, it can be removed from the audio library and the interface is kind of more disposable than, let's say, the DSP code, which will be the most important part and the most kind of like time-consuming part. So that's kind of that model view controller platform, uh, pattern. That's what Juice is based on. Um, yeah, I just started uh, establishing naming conventions between myself and Pierre. He was going to do the interface. I was working on the, on the audio library. And where the two meet, there has to be <laughs> solid naming conventions. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we started off small, sign oscillator, filter, and an output. And we just wrote those little modules in C++. And then we started to kind of grow out from that. And as we started to build the different modules, we saw patterns emerging amongst these different modules. Like every module will have inputs. Every module will have outputs. Every module might have controls, you know? So you start to see how this system then can be kind of abstracted into something bigger and how you can kind of see the repetition between the modules and then you kind of come up with an idea of how to kind of, um, yeah, make everything generic so that it can expand because it's easy to do something that's very small like a sine oscillator, oscillator and a filter and an output but then if you go and expand that into like, you know, 50 modules, um, yeah, it can get pretty, pretty messy very fast so you have to kind of like start small, see what's common amongst everything and then abstract that into base classes. I'm, I'm not sure how many people here are programmers, but you'll probably be aware of what I'm, what I'm talking about if you are. Um, yeah, so you start seeing notice as actions as well. Like if you have these modules, you say, oh, I want to connect this module to that module. So that means that's a function call, so that needs to be done. Um, so we just came up with this uh, module base class, which is like this common thing that every module is inside the audio library. Um, I can actually show you what that class looks like if you want to see it. So, uh, so this is the base class of all modules. Every module in our in our library filters, um, oscillators, everything is based on this. Um, if you're familiar with C++, you can see here. So the set input bus channel. Um, this get module. Let's see, set module uh, process input connection. These are all uh, functions that are common across every single module within the library. So we then put those into this base class and that allows us to like then make things generic. So less kind of like complexity goes into the lower modules like the filters and everything like that. And then we can just have those up in a base class and not deal with them um, uh, when you're actually writing your DSP code or everything. So you don't have to, you know, it's all about kind of making sure that things don't get too complex when when the library starts to go from these like simple modules out into bigger ones. Um, yeah, we've like oversampling factors, all this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, so let's go back here. Right. 
Yeah, so we also needed some way of, once we have these modules with all their inputs and their outputs, we needed a way of actually like um, maintaining those connections. So when if you saw earlier where I kind of got one of these outputs from a modulation source and connected it up to an input, we had to have kind of like a system that would kind of um, control all those connections and maintain them. And then if we like open up a new preset or a new sound, then it has to be able to build up all those connections between all those different modules. So what we did, we came up with this idea of an output pin. So each module has an output pin, which is basically just um, a pointer uh, in C++. And around that pointer, then we create another object that describes what that pointer does. So is it like an audio source? Is it a modulation source? Is it, um, are we going to process it once every 32 samples? Are we going to process it at audio rates? Like if we need to do frequency modulation, you want to have like audio rate um, connections. So, yeah, that's basically what it is, and you just kind of like get a module, you request its output pin based on a connection you're making on the interface with that dot, it goes into the list of modules, it takes that pin, and then it reads the descriptor, sees what type of pin it is, and then it drops it wherever you're going to drop it, and it just basically takes a pointer and code and just connects it up somewhere else. And that's how the audio connections are made. Um, the modules are then stored inside a module store. So we have like a big array of modules here like this with identifiers. So you can kind of pull out modules whenever you want, uh, depending on what connections you're making. Um, it, it makes sense that modulations are processed first. So all those little um, uh, sine wave generators and envelopes and stuff like that, they're all processed first. Then we go and we do the audio line, which is in order of, as you saw it on the interface. So all those oscillators, they first produce all their sounds. Then they're written into those pointers that are connected up to other parts of the audio library. They're then processed again, let's say, in the filter and the mixer and everything. And then it's out to the VCA and into the host or out into your sound card. Yeah, every module has this process uh, module function. Uh, so complexity, yeah. Basic system was created first, then we needed to scale up to 40 plus modules. And we, what we found is that as you start to scale up, that it gets super complex in terms of just maintaining the code. You know, if you have 40 modules and there's all this repetition across all these different modules, they all have process functions and they all have these different, you know, uh, parameters that need to be set. So what we decided to do is that we would um, do auto generation. So rather than repeating ourselves 40 times, we just write one file that describes every module in the synthesizer and we write that in XML and then uh, we use a script that reads in that XML and then it auto generates all the files for us. So we don't actually have to maintain like enormous amounts of, of files if there's 40 files with, with all their different you know descriptor files for each pin and, and the inputs and the outputs. So yeah we just use this auto generation and that kind of main, allows us to, um, to kind of keep things manageable you know. Um, yeah. So it, 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 yeah. So it's basically just an XML file, and we can add new modules. We just type in the name of a module, what its inputs and its outputs are, and then it gets added into the audio library. Yeah, which is what I'm describing there. Yeah. So you just insert the DSP code. Um, yeah. So DSP. Um, I studied in Queen Mary, and I became aware of the DAFX conferences. So. Uh, we've, a lot of the DSP will be based on uh, papers produced at the conference, and um, let's say for for the filter especially, you know, we're basing it on the uh, Pro One from sequen sequential circuits. So, uh, what we would go about doing is creating, let's say, a four-pole low-pass filter. Um, we would then look at the hardware synth, and we would see that as you sweep the resonance uh, on the on the filter that it maybe gets like more stronger as you go up in frequency and we would measure that kind of curve of how that resonance changes as you sweep and then we would kind of maybe um, use lookup tables or maybe use some fitting curves to kind of match that filter curve so it kind of gives us the sound of what we what we uh, what we wanted to do so, yeah uh, so you can kind of recreate the, the kind of this, that classic analog sound in the filters Tricks of the trade, yes, yeah, the main thing is just to sit down and just draw the system out first. Um, start with small basic modules and units. Um, abstract everything that's common across those up into base classes so you don't actually have to deal with them when you're writing your DSP code. Then look at everything that's common across all these different modules and write this auto-generation thing. So you can just basically type into an XML file what a module is, what its inputs and its outputs are, 
and then it generates all the associated files for its pins and everything like that. So it just makes it a lot easier and you can scale it in a manageable way. Because if you look at, um, yeah, at, at um, the commercial level plugins, with that type of functionality, um, with a small team, you have to be able to kind of um, manage it in a way that um, it doesn't get out of hand. And, and the way to do that is through auto generation. Uh, yeah, the last thing was copy protection. Um, uh, I'd say don't waste your time is, is, is the main thing there. Uh, Circle was cracked within three days of release. So we, we launched it, uh, uploaded it. Um, within three days, you could Google and find it somewhere cracked. So it's just don't waste your time. The most important thing is that people cannot create like a key gen. Uh, these key generators are just like things that produce serial codes automatically. If they can do that, if they can create a key gen, that means they can just create a, a license code for every one of your softwares regardless of your update. So you need to make, make it impossible for a key gen. Um, yeah. So when, when we released it then at the Music Mesa, uh, we went and showed it to distributors. We had a stand. Uh, they were all kind of impressed with it. Um, uh, we got the sound design done, so we kind of pushed it out kind of in its beta phase to sound designers. They kind of went and made preset sounds for it. Um, after that, then we had to get our support stuff together, web store, all these other surrounding things, which actually proved to be a lot of work in the end. Um, yeah, so at the end, it took about one and a half years with everything surrounding, like copy protection and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so, and then David Guetta used it in one of his hit songs, which was quite interesting. I was coming over today even, and I heard it on the, on the bus. So it's like you're sitting down, you're listening on a bus, and you just hear this distinctive sound from something you've created in a hit song. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, sound and sound were positive, uh, which was kind of like the, the test of, of everything, really. Um, and we got great feedback from, from the user base once they started using it and, and using it in their music. And, yeah. So that's kind of the overview. So if anybody has questions... Um, I don't know what, the, what people's backgrounds are if they're... If they're um, Programmers, or, or does anybody has questions? All right, <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so, has anybody got questions about about the process and and yeah? Um, I was just interested in whether it's easier for you to model uh, a physical circuit or actually start from scratch on your own? Um, uh, I think it's, uh, I think at the time that we were doing it, uh, you know, people are talking about doing like piece by piece models and that kind of stuff and, and working out exactly how the circuit works and then modeling every single component inside a, inside a filter. I think uh, at the point we were doing it, um, the processor would be chewed by that. So um, I think what we were doing was we'd take like a broader look at the functional aspects of the filter and then maybe tune it empirically to match something that we wanted. So if we wanted, like, you know, uh, let's say if we saw that, like, maybe it needs more of a DC offset, then we just add a DC offset. We'd have a look at the harmonics on a spectrum analyzer. we kind of see if those harmonics are matching up what we're doing in the software. If they're not, then we maybe try and use different types of, you know, nonlinearities and everything like that to try and get out that, that kind of sound. It's, 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 it's the hardest part in analog modeling is you can really nail the sound at one point. It's, it's when you sweep or, or change. That's when it gets really, really difficult. Um, but there are ways of getting that right as well, or close enough, yeah, so that it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. Uh, for, uh, do you... Do you have you done physical modeling or no, analog no, modeling? No, I've no. done that all actually. Yeah. <laughs> the electronic circuits side of it is my field. Yeah. I find it interesting where, uh, where programmers start, where their starting point would be. And it's interesting that you say actually uh, you can only recreate, you can only emulate this point at, yeah. one, at one specific time, at one setting, you know, at one frequency rather than whole audio band, and it was just interesting to see where you would, whether you would say, okay, I would take this oscillator from this um, synth schematic, yeah. try and recreate it that way, or just say, actually, I just know what the outcome I want. And yeah, it's more the outcome I want, and then every, every DSP engineer has their own tricks that they pick up along the way, and 
just kind of use those and, and use those kind of um, different ways of like tuning to to match up to different different synthesizer sounds that you want. Uh, but one of the things we're trying to do is maybe not get too focused on the analog side of things, and maybe when it's on a computer, it should be kind of like its own character and not make it an emulation of something. Um, so that's kind of, you know, you want some of the aspects of the analog sound because it's like, um, you know, there is this tradition there, but we were also trying to bring in this digital side as well with, you know, the wavetables and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick one. Um, what was the hardest point for you? What was the, the kind of the trick where you almost hit the wall where you're like, do I still want to do this? Is, what was the, the um, almost the death of Circle, shall we say? There was no real point where we got, uh, got that bad. Um, of, course, of course, over like it, basically what we did is that we, um, the guy I started the company with, Pierre, we just moved to the countryside in Ireland and we just shut down, you know, and we just stayed there for like one year working, you know, 14 hours a day, seven days a week, just going to the shop to buy food. That was it. So you can imagine that if we did it much longer than we would have cracked, it did get a bit towards the end, but yeah. But I don't think there's any one specific point. Um, I think once you just keep your goal, goal ahead and you kind of break everything down into like smaller parts and you kind of like try and make it manageable from the start, you're always aware of it getting too complex, then I think you can get to the end without um, uh, too much trouble. And then as things work, you get more confidence about what you're doing and you're always making sounds and that sounds good and kind of drives it forward. It's kind of an iterative process. It's, yeah, yeah. Can you elaborate a bit on the bass class, like uh, how that works, how, how you designed that, I don't know. We basically, what we did was, um, we just kind of figured out what a module would be, you know, like we have an oscillator here, what are its outputs, what are its inputs, all these different things. And then we just took that oscillator, then we created another module, another module, so then it made a sound. And then we looked at that and we said, okay, all of these have functions called process the module. All of these functions, all, all of these modules have an on-off switch. All of these modules have inputs and outputs. And then what we do is we just take that functionality and we remove it from the actual module, the distinct module itself, and push it up into a base class so we don't have to see it anymore. You know, we don't have to deal with it. And I think that's basically what, what, what the whole thing about this base module base is that commonalities amongst the modules are then pushed up into the base class and then when I'm working I don't actually see any of that. I'm just working on a basic DSP code here and you know maybe some 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 uh, classes from the base class will be will be used in front of me but I won't have to deal so much with that stuff because you kind of have to be able to black box things and just walk away from them for a while uh, in code you know so you don't <laughs> you know so it's like yeah uh, are, are you a programmer yourself? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's a pretty standard. It's totally standard C plus plus thing, but it's just how to kind of identify what to put up there and yeah, into the, and just to make it easier for yourself. And yeah, yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, I just have a, a couple actually, if I might. Yeah. Um, the, the first is what, like, uh, what percentage of the, of the sound do you think is defined by these analog modeling techniques versus the the other side, which is just the, how you've designed the synth. Yeah, it's 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 um, uh, when when you try and emulate an entire synthesizer, that's like you know if you want to emulate a Moog or something like that, that's one process. With us, we just kind of had a look at the filter and kind of tuned it to a Pro One that we had. Uh, so then there was no real kind of like distinct synthesizer we were trying to copy. So whatever came out of the code came out of the code. If it sounded a little bit too aggressive then, or there was kind of like maybe the distortion was too much on it, we kind of toned that down. We we're kind of going for a, a more digital sound than, than, you know, a lot of the other plugins. We were kind of thinking like, does the world need another analog emulation of a sense from the 70s, or are we better off just putting our own personality into it and kind of making something that's more digital sounding and, and whatever. Do you feel that, that that gave it like its kind of little special sparkle at the end, or is it really just kind of one of those things you do because everybody's analog modeling? 
It's, it's, it's almost accidental. Sometimes, yeah. you know, if, if, if you're just, just, you know, doing algorithms and stuff like that and something just sounds the way it does straight yeah. away, whatever way you've done it, um, then after a while you kind of get into that sound and that becomes the sound of the synthesizer. You know, I'd say like when Bob Moog was doing the Moog, he didn't know exactly what it was going to sound like until it was finished. So, yeah. Uh, and so it's a little bit of magic and it's just process really, you know, when you go through something and yeah, sometimes it ends up a certain way, sometimes it doesn't. And, mm. Yeah. The other question if I have, you like, if, yeah. I, if I may, is um, you talked about the the how useful it was having frameworks like Juice in order to give you a start. I'm just wondering if you, along the way, designed any of your own scaffolding, if you will, to, for instance, like to do the analog modeling, like the, the code to design the kind of, um, um, to come up with sort of, uh, you know, the wave patterns you then use to augment the filters. Did you design any of that along the way? And would you consider open sourcing that as well? Um. We did some some little bits and pieces, but um, at that time, open source was not it wasn't what it is now. In, in, uh, um, but we have we haven't open sourced any of our any of our software. No. Yeah. So um, I was actually going to ask about looking forwards and. Um, and you know what what sort of comes next and i just thinking about that i thought so who did you design this for did you kind of design it for yourself or did you have a particular user in mind and maybe you know what keeps you ahead of the game and and what comes next is it just making this synth better or easier to use or different products completely i mean i, I don't yeah. expect you to give your kind of business strategy away but i'm just sort of interested in in what's next yeah that's it's you know um I think the process is, is something that uh, more so than, than changing Circle. I'd say Circle, it's audio engine, because of the Juice framework, I've actually been able to get it to run on the iPad. So because it has abstracted everything to do with the hardware, you can just kind of like target the iPad and Circle's interface pops up the same way as it does on the iPad. Of course, the, we'd have to adjust the interface, but that could be some direction that we'd like to go in. Uh, uh, but personally, I think that, it, yeah, uh, things are heading more in the, in the iPad direction and Android and yeah I think the laptop itself um, yeah, I was just saying earlier on that you know 15 year olds probably won't ever buy a laptop or own a laptop it's through the course of their life um, so it's going to be all tablets and, and stuff like this so we're going to try and provide them with the tools that they need to make music and yeah and, and even like if you look at um, music industry itself the you know the actual selling of music is kind of like not happening uh, as it as it used to so i think the whole production aspects of of music making it this kind of like produced record that has this sound i think that's kind of going away and what we're having what we're seeing is like kids just kind of making music and directly releasing it to soundcloud so that whole release cycle is reduced down to you know a uh, couple of hours and that's immediacy like uh, I, we did an iPhone application for a guy called Dead Mouse who's this kind of music producer and what he's doing at the moment is like he has his fans on Facebook and SoundCloud he makes a track in the afternoon and then he pushes it to SoundCloud straight away so that's the production cycle it's not this one year thing that you know involves like mixing and you know mastering it's just like this cycle so I think, yeah, that's what we're going to do is try and maybe put some of those technologies into applications so you can push stuff out once you've recorded it. Uh, you know, I think we're in the year of, of, yeah, everyone's, as you say, everyone's famous for 15 minutes, everyone's famous to 15 people. I think that's, that's the new, new way things are going with the music industry. And that's good, too, because you think about, like, yeah, you know, um, is a diminishing returns on, on how famous you are and, and the appreciation that you people give to the music you produce. So I think, yeah, letting everybody create music and share it is, is, is a positive thing. Yeah. And hopefully we put that in our software. Yeah. Well, I've got a, a question from a developer, really. Yeah. If you're designing a software... Mic. Okay, I can project. Can people hear me? For the benefit of the recording, I'm now speaking into the microphone. Um, if you're designing a soft synth, more so with a, than with a hard synth, you're starting out with a completely blank canvas, so your interconnections aren't defined, the, the sort of effects you're using and the way you filters aren't defined, and it's just two of you in a, in a place in Ireland for a year 
working 14 hour days, to a fairly loose spec. Now, as a designer myself, I wonder how do you know when to stop and how do you know when you've got the thing right? How did you get through that cycle and know, right, we've got a product now, let's release it? Um, when you say a loose spec, we actually we had a fairly tight specification at the start, you know. Um, it's never tight enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, there was kind of like mission creep, as they say. Yeah, yeah, to kind of more stuff was kind of being put in every now and again. But, yeah, we kind, of, we kind of, before we started, we did know that it was going to be a commercial plugin, that it would have to appeal to a market, and it would also have to appeal to distributors. So we were aware of how to, you know, fix our specifications so it, it would work within that system. Um, so, yeah, we, did, we didn't get too... But I do know I have, I have friends who are, who are making a synth for maybe four or five years and yes. it's never going to get finished. You know, it's like <laughs> Pretty much the hardest thing to freeze is a parameter list when you stop adding modulation sources, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. If I do this, it sounds really cool. Will the customer like it? Will the customer even know about it? Yeah. You know, it's questions like that that can really derail a project if you don't nail them down. We, we're working with good designers as well. Like, and, you know, sometimes you can be in this kind of bubble. It's, it's always a problem with when, when you're working on something and you know how it works and everybody else who's working on the project knows how it works, but the customer hasn't a clue when they see it. You know, it's like, what is this? So we did have designers, if we were going too far off on a, uh, off on a tangent, that they'd say, okay, guys, you know, that's like un understandable. <laughs> Please go backwards, yeah. So it's, it's always important to, yeah, I would recommend, it, you know, getting your user base involved early in the development So process. you did do a lot of user experience testing? Um, mostly on ourselves, like we're, we're testing components and stuff like that. We'd send them over to the designers. They'd kind of test them out and say, oh, that feels a little bit not right or whatever. And then you kind of go back and try and change it so that it works properly. But it's, yeah, it's very hard to kind of sit down and totally know what you're going to do at the start. But you can have a good framework within it so that you get to the end of the project and it doesn't get out of control. Yeah. Yeah. Get the users and the patch designers to make some of those decisions for you, and they're yeah. generally right. Yeah, uh, it is, and sometimes like uh, the the big problem as well with synth design is that you know you start to ask your customer base, and they all have like small little quirky requests themselves, and then they all get pushed in, and then it becomes like a a jack of all trades and a master of none. It's you know it kind of it kind of yeah kind of. It, so sometimes it's good to be able to, you know, say no to features, you know. You can domesticate your users to some extent, I think. Yeah. You have yeah. to. Yeah. Any other questions? Ah. Have the microphone of power. Thank you. Um, I'm from Queen Mary as well. Hey. All right, yeah. um, I have a question about, so you said it was a year's, it was a year in development. Was yeah. it something that you funded yourself, or did you get investment prior to developing it um, to allow you to have that time? Because it sounds like a wonderful... We were lucky enough that um, my parents had a, had a spare house that we could stay in for, for one year. Right. That meant the rent was taken care of. Um, we then had savings as well that could keep us going food-wise. It really was like that. You know? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and, uh, yes, and we also got some help from, from the Irish state for, for new business startups, so... But uh, it wouldn't have been any substantial amount compared to what you know people normally would need if you're in a in a large city paying a higher rent and everything. So, but it's doable. It's totally doable if you if if you can find somewhere with cheap rent. You know, a lot of people. That's why Berlin is kind of the center of music software, and it's kind of getting good with startups. Is that you can actually move there and live. Uh, you know, be able to actually survive in a city with people. Because that's the other problem is is getting connections. You know, and and finding right people to work with and. Yeah, it's important yeah, to be able to be in a city and be able to keep your rent paid and food on the table and be able to develop stuff. We couldn't do it, so we had to move to the country, but uh, I think you can... <laughs> Berlin especially, I think, is, is that's why music software is, is popular there because um, of that situation whereby rent is so cheap and food is cheap and there's all these people around there who are interested in music and it just creates this kind of um, yeah, perfect storm for, for like Ableton and Native Instruments and all these things, yeah. Also, what did you, I know this is about the kind of back-end side of it, what did you do yeah. the UI in? What's, what, what did you do, what, what did you code the UI in? What's, it's what all from? done in Juice. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. they're just Juice controls. Um, you know, if you've seen Juice, there's yeah. like, yeah. There, and there's also custom controls in there, but there would, there would be Juice controls with overlaid uh, bitmap images on top. 
So it's almost like a flick book when you turn. If, if you just see here, um, just give you a quick look. Yep. Yeah, so that's that's a standard juice control there, and that's a standard juice pop-up. And we've just overlaid those with images, so as you turn, we're like looking into an array of images and just displaying them. Uh, but then, of course, there's loads of custom controls, like this is not a juice control here, this, this sine wave. So what's happening there is that um, the interface is going into the audio library. It knows what... Uh, module this is, it's looking at the output that that audio module is producing and then displaying that in, in this curve here. And as we're turning this here, it's, it's setting a, a value in module base for the rate of uh, the LFO. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And w what are you doing yourself? Are you a programmer? I'm um, doing my master's in kind of similar field, DSP yeah. kind of stuff. A little bit more hardware, yeah. At the moment, but I mean, everything re reverts back to code and yeah, everything like that. Can't so. get away from it. Yeah. yeah. Does Juice handle the graphics for that, or do you have to have a separate library for? It? No, Juice is handling the graphics. Yeah, it, it Juice handles threading. It handles everything. Yeah. yeah, messaging between the interface and the audio library. So, like every time I turn a knob here, yeah. um, this kicks off a Juice. Um, event and that event then triggers a system that we have in place for communicating with the audio library in a way that it doesn't kind of like makes the thread safe and whatever. Does it also do the um, like vector operations for, is it optimized for, for vector processors like mm -hmm. iOS? Um, do you no, know? There's no, there's, there's, we're not using any kind of juice functionality for the DSP or mm -hmm. the algorithm or anything like that. It's basically just for the interface and communication with um, the audio library and also to allow us to do VST, RTAS, and audio unit plugins. Yeah. Is there any trickery with the, v, the, the DSP that you, like in, in iOS, which I, I work in, there's a, it's iOS, called yeah. the Accelerate Framework, which lets you do, um, harness the, the risk processors, like vector operations, instead of having to loop through your buffer and like, you know, add the waves, you just do one command and it, it it's does, yeah. massively faster. Yeah. Is there anything like that that you've utilized for the, the Mac PC kind of platform? No, I think um, a lot of the lot of the time, you know, your compiler gets you to a certain point, and for that extra maybe five percent, you could spend another year just to get that five percent. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. look at I mean, do look at yeah. when you get into iOS. It's called the Accelerate Framework. I mean, it wasn't. Yeah. It was like fifty, sixty percent was it, yeah. reduction in CPU um, yeah. by doing these vector operations. Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to ask about um, the, the hardware platform. So if, for example, you were coding for a platform that had 100 times faster CPU or 100 times more memory, would you have done anything different? Um, yeah, I think most, like the most DSP, tec DSP techniques, you can kind of like just scale them up more. You know, if, if you want to do interpolation, you just go to a higher order, you know, and all those things can help with, with the audio quality. So if, if, if you did have this, this computer that could do anything you want, then maybe we could get into doing these piece by models and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, but I think for us, it was enough because, you know, I think the sound, we were happy with it in the end and, and everything like that. I, I don't, I think you can all, always, you know, kind of optimize and optimize and optimize, but I think we're at a point now where it's not, I think most computers that people have are able to run the latest plugins and, and be able to get, you know, 16 voices on a fairly heavy patch. And I think that's, that's all most people need, yeah. So is it basically a case that users wouldn't notice if you were to build in this extra functionality? Yeah. Or extra performance. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, they, they probably would notice, but um, yeah, it all depends on, on what type of music you're making, you know, if you're, if you're layering up 20 circles and trying to use, you know, 16 voices on each one, then yeah, you're going to run into trouble, but most people are just like using, you know, mono, mono patches with, you know, bass lines and maybe some pads and stuff and mixing it with other synths that they're also running like, and uh, yeah. I think. 
Yeah. Just a, a kind of a business question. There's an earlier one down here. I'm in a null somewhere in the wireless network. Um, so I was wondering how much uh, market survey you did before setting out on this, uh, setting up the company to assess the potential economic uh, success of the company. Yeah. Uh, you could say, you know, were you led by your head or were you led by your heart to uh, go into the soft synth business? It was totally by heart, yeah, I'd say. Yeah, <laughs> you know, if, if you're leading by your head, you're not going to get involved in, in plug-in design, you know. <laughs> There's like a hundred other things you could do and, and, and probably be financially more successful at. But for me personally, I, I was, you know, interested in this. And I'm interested in, in building a career in audio. Uh, yeah. And I think there's so many opportunities, you know, for, for just guys starting off now. And with these frameworks and with, even with iOS and everything, that if you can find two or three people that you get on well with and you can, you know, maybe just kind of focus on something for a year, you can, you know, produce... Uh, uh, a piece of software that that can you know sustain you all f you know for 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 a good number of years until you have to develop something again, and I think yeah that wasn't the case up until recently. It's all it's all these frameworks and everything they're helping and and the you know the app store they're taking that whole distribution thing and it's box software which you'd have to get all that mechanisms around in your company, so it's becoming more and more easy for individuals who have kind of common ideas to get together and make software and actually survive and live on it, yeah. So maybe, yeah, it's maybe the, the new music industry is more software-based. Maybe, you know, instead of recording a song, you create, create a machine that makes music. It's, you know, it's, there's other ways to make a living from music than, yeah, <laughs> now that the old ways are kind of falling, falling down. But there's, you know, if, if you look at what's happening around you and just kind of, yeah, use, use that, you can still work with music, yeah. You said at the start you um, drew it all out on a napkin or, and expanded basic a drawing. Yeah. Um, would you not uh, try building it in uh, Max or Reactor first? Or, yeah. You know, how would you go from that idea to uh, this is kind of what it sounds like? Or did you have to sort of code a large portion? You'd have to code before you figure out before what, you hear what it sounds like, yeah. But you kind of like, once you do your oscillators and your filter, you generally have a good idea of what it's going to sound like. Um, so if you get those done early on in the process, you kind of have a, a general sound. Now, it will change at different points, you know, if you kind of like, once you then put five oscillators together, maybe they're kind of like, the phase of them is kind of like, cancelling each other out or it's making kind of like different types of sounds that you weren't expecting and then maybe you have to kind of like put in stuff like offsetting the phase on different oscillators and all these things to kind of so you you came up with the idea in your head you put it on paper and you coded it and heard and then it. you start tuning and seeing oh that sounds good that doesn't sound good yeah so it's kind of like a process rather than taking something that was already established like a, a moog and then saying okay we want ours to sound exactly like that um which is probably not that that interesting. Like if you're, <laughs> you know, if you want to do something that's your own rather than someone someone else's. Yeah. Okay, that was just my question. Just, yeah. That was it. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to know. I mean, you said you didn't want to follow just a Moog and then try and. Uh, emulate that but yeah. you must have had some sonic references so that when you did code it and you did hear it for the first time you thought that's either bang on what I want or it's a million miles away was that all in your head or did you have specific things you'd have in the in the room or in the office that you'd mm. kind of play on and, and refer back to in the design stage yeah, it was, a lot of it too was based on, on kind of like the um, style of music we were kind of listening to at that moment while we were coding, you know. I, I know Pierre, he's French and he's in, into this kind of like French house music and whatever and he was like, wanted to get it kind of more gritty and dirty so he'd say, yeah, we need to put in a distortion in there or we need to make it more rough. We don't want to kind of like a, just a nice synth, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's all those things and as you're going along then you can kind of change the sound depending on, on what's what you wanted to do. I, we did really want to go for a digital sound, um, it just purely f just to make it kind of unique and kind of what we're into, you know. Um, 
yeah, so that would have meant, you know, kind of maybe not having so much kind of like variance in the sound. So when you press a key, that it kind of just keeps, maintains that same kind of sound in the oscillator and, yeah, removes out a lot of that kind of uh, variance that was in the, the analog emulation type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And how about with um, your sensitivity now to other people's soft synths? Have you found that having dedicated so much time to making one and tuning one that when you hear other people's you kind of think oh yeah I know what that that's a that's an easy one or, <laughs> you know has it changed the way you look and listen to other people's software yeah it changes the way you listen to music it, 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 totally like you know um but that it, it, that comes with DSP and engineering in general like you know um once you know what's going on and you kind of you know, you know it changes the way yeah you, you hear a sound and you no longer actually kind of just hear the sound you're like thinking about his frequency on, on a spectrum analyzer you know this kind of stuff and yeah so that that yeah and when you hear other people since then you kind of like think maybe oh, that's the type of algorithm they're doing or you know you can kind of tell and it's it's amazing that whatever it is once you start to do something with even with even with uh, software you know even in a defined way compared to analog circuits that it can actually end up quite uh, a variant uh, variance from where you thought you would have started, you know, in terms of the sound and everything. Like, we did not know that that's the way that synth was going to sound until it, it was finished. Yeah. So that's create this kind of interesting process as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think anyone, like, I don't think, you, I don't think anyone sits down and says, okay, I want it to sound, well, you do if you're going to try and make a mode, but if you're trying to just do your, your own thing, you just kind of say, okay, see what happens as we're going along, you know? I think that's, yeah. So you said you wanted to make a digital synth, but then what did you do about aliasing? You know, like if you have square waves and they get high, you get harmonics that get reflected back exactly, yeah. through the sample, right? Yeah, well, there's all ways of doing that. You can just, like, oversample your audio engine, so you just run it at four times or whatever, eight times the rate of... of, of all right, so that's, that's what you did. And then step it down again when you, when you want to get there, so your aliasing doesn't come in. Right, OK, so you, you, you deliberately tried to counter that. Oh, you, you have to, yeah. You, you know, um, sound on sound will, you know, go through all this with a microscope and... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, if you're aliasing... <laughs> Gordon Reed will write it in his <laughs> review, so yeah, you have to make sure that you get it right. Yeah. So, from what you said earlier about developing for iOS, presumably you're not that interested in whether it'll work under AAX plugin format. Yeah, I think the AAX, that's whereby you can run it on, on the Pro Tools hardware. It's, it's, it is possible for us to do it because, um, again, thanks to Juice, they now allow us to just take our code base and just target AX so it'll... Oh, right, so Juice yeah. will do that? It will, yeah. yeah. Right. And did you do, make your own copy protection system? Yeah, we did, yeah. yeah. Uh, as I said, it was just, just enough so people couldn't create a key gen. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. But it, you would have... We set up like a server, a copy protection server, so when you first go to use the synth, it dials to the server and checks the code, and then it uses some kind of encryption there and sends it back again. And are there libraries for doing that, or did you have to basically uh, make your own? We had to kind of do our own, but there's kind of ways of you kind of figure out how to do it. You know, it's kind of like um, this, you know, um, um, I don't want to get too, too much into it. <laughs> give away the secrets, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, and just put checkpoints in the code. That's, that's, what, that's how they crack this off. It's just checkpoints in the code where we check this code. Uh, that's key files stored in the hard disk. And the guys who are cracking the software, they just decompile it, and they can see what's happening here like this. They see it's checking the file, and they just basically whoosh, delete out that line of code, and then there's your copy protection gone. So, and there's no way. You can do all kinds of tricks, but they're always going to find it. Like it's, so the, is it tied to a particular machine? It is, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it takes, it takes the, the, um, the MAC address from your network card and then uses that to kind of create a hash code that's sent back to the server and then that gives you back a license key. And, yeah. and so you issue other multiple authorizations to some people yeah, if they're running on more than one computer. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Move them around. But I think, yes, uh, I know that the industry kind of went into the whole key thing for a while, but I think, yeah, I think that was more kind of punishing people who are paying for the software rather than, yeah. 
well, it's be better than Apple's system where you just need a serial number and you can install it on as many computers as you like, really, yeah. for logic and things like that. Exactly. I think, I think uh, where, you, where a company really needs to just accept that, you know, you're going to get cracked and that most people are going to use cracked versions. Professionals, you hope, would then pay for it. And it, the best you can do is offer really good support. So if someone, a professional, has a problem, that you can reply back in, you know, 12 hours to that problem and solve it for them. And then it's almost like that contact is what, is what, is what they're paying for. That's, that's rather than the software because it's, it's, it's cracked and it can be used every, it can be found everywhere. So that's what, what we see is that you have to really support is, is, is what people are buying more than, than the software now. That seems to be the way people are thinking about things. Yeah. And uh, do you feel it's repaid your investment in time? And oh, yeah, big time, yeah. Big time. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just, you know, it's a great process to just to say, because, it, you know, it's, it's always a bit like jumping off a cliff and saying, you know, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to just try and make, make a company with a friend, you know, and it's like that whole process. And then you get to the end and then you, you know, go to Mesa. And then, like, I remember when I was, like, 14 or 15 reading Sound on Sound in the getting it in the local news agent and not understanding anything about anything in it, but wanting to know about it. And then seeing something that you've built being reviewed in that magazine and kind of getting that positive feedback, um, it makes it all worthwhile, yeah. But then presumably you're going to reinvest. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you have to kind of, then the next thing that comes, you have to try and start thinking about how to build a company so we can sustain ourselves. And, you know, for your friends that want to work in the same thing that, we can create a company that is sustainable so that we can all kind of build lives and stuff like that. So Well, good luck. <laughs> yeah, build off from there. All right. I'm intrigued from a totally non-programmer side of it, more a user side. Yeah. So you've got this lump of code that is your... Oh. <laughs> um, we've got this lump of code that is your synth and you've got this front end on it that you've basically made look like an analog synth. Have you now thought to yourself, well, look, I've got this lump of stuff. Let's make an interface that's utterly different. Let's find a completely different way of attacking those parameters. Yeah. I mean, okay, you've got your, your representations of waveforms that I wouldn't have on my VCS3, but yeah. it's still basically a VCS3. You've still got modules plugged together. I know what you mean, yeah. And one thing I'd, I've always wanted to do is be able to say, I mean, okay, the analog synth, you've got your knobs, you've got your pots, because that's the way the analog circuit works. Yeah. But now it's in digital. Yeah. You can say, okay, throw that whole front end away. Let's invent a new way of mutilating it. Exactly, and I think that's kind of where, where the iPad comes in because uh, with this, you're always going to be like using it within the context of um, a sequencer program. And if you start to go too abstract in, or, or just like people are used to using a, a professional tool in a certain way, and then if you go too way in another direction that they don't understand, then you know your plugin isn't used. But well, on yeah, the but iPad, I mean... it, it allows us to like introduce kind of new concepts yeah. because you, you don't have that host, you don't have logic, mm. you don't have Cubase, you just have this screen that's touch interface. So, yeah. And you can see what people are doing there. They're doing some super interesting things that this whole, you know, you can have like three-dimensional spaces of parameters and, and like even kids, they don't even know what they're doing. <laughs> they're just like messing around mm. with, with stuff and it's kind of bringing that, you, this is an analytical situation whereby you kind of like think about something you're going to do and then you go and do it. Whereas I think with the iPad and what you're talking about, that there is kind of ways of like where you don't need to know anything about modules or anything like that and just kind of interact with sound in different ways. And that's super interesting yeah, as well. That's because you, you've got your engine. So now you can just Put whack an interface. Yeah. On it. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've had perverse dreams of force feedback gloves and 3D spaces <laughs> yeah. and all sorts of things for mixing for yeah. years. But... Hasn't happened yet. I have, yeah, yeah. 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 It sounds a bit like uh, Imogen Heaps, the glove project, where she's got some, some gloves and she can just yes, weigh yeah, yeah. stuff around and makes cool sounds. Or the Microsoft Connect as well, you know. Yeah. The resolution's a bit low on it, but that's all interesting stuff as well. Yeah. Are you all the question, Dad? 
Two things left. Um, first thing, principal thing, is to thank you, Gavin, for a very engaging talk. Good not for, only from a technical point of view, but from a business one. It's actually quite inspiring. I might go and lock myself away in Ireland for a year <laughs> and see what I come up with. So thank you for that. And um, you don't have to applaud for this, but thank you to Red Bull Studios for letting us use their venue. And thank you to everyone for coming.